What's up guys, this is Mad Chad, and this is my 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Chad, here we go, 5, 5 favorite robots of all time. Like, real robots? Okay, so if we're talking real robots, uh, I'm gonna have to go number one, Boston Dynamics, Pet Man. Pretty much, um, <laughs> I know it's a crazy name, weird name, but uh, Boston Dyna Dynamics, they make robots for the military. They pretty much test out the gear, like the jackets and the boots and everything, and just moves crazy, you know what I mean? Number two, I'm gonna have to go with, not really a robot, but there are like these animatronic gorillas at a place called Rainforest Camp Cafe, downtown Disney. Yeah, animatronic gorillas. They look insane, I love them. Number three is gonna have to be uh, the Honda robot, Asimo. It's like a smoother kind of movement, crazy uh, controlled kind of feel, kind of stops. And, like, moves and Not really too glitchy, just kind of like really controlled and smooth, almost very human. Let's see, number four. Uh, this is uh, another Boston Dynamics robot, and this one's called Big Dog. And <laughs> It's like a gas-powered robot that's made for transferring stuff for the military from like point A to point B. And so it's got this crazy engine, it's like and it like walks, its legs come up real quick. Um, and it, had, it can like balance itself and stuff like that. And then number five is a robot. It's not like what you would think of as something that I would get like influenced by as far as the way it moves necessarily, but it's called the Keep On Robot and it was designed for uh, autistic children. And some guys from Carnegie Mellon took it and they programmed it to like dance to music. And it's this little like yellow ball and it sits on top of this little like black platform and it kind of bobs up and down to whatever beat you play. It's pretty crazy. It's got like these funny little eyes and you get a sense of like personality from this little robot. Alright, four. Give us your top four influences in the game. Number one, that would be Bob and Andre. He was my first real influence. I thought popping was cool. I saw Bob and Andre and pretty much he blew me away. He was the first dancer to make me question the reality of what I was seeing. And to me that's popping. That's like the magical aspect of Number two is uh, Flat Top, and he's another one where his illusion is just so crazy that um, he just blows you away when you see him in person. You know, I saw him uh, in Venice and uh, Universal City Walk and some other places. But yeah, so Flat Top. And then my number three is David Elsewhere. And I say that because most people are probably like, well, you don't dance anything like Elsewhere. But Elsewhere inspired me and influenced me a lot. His whole outlook on dance in general and his need to be original and the way he trained and everything that like really inspired me and influenced me a lot. And number four, that's gonna be Tabo. If you're in the LA popping scene, you probably know who Tabo is. If you're not, you don't. He helps a lot of people in the underground LA scene. He's he's a control freak, control master. He doesn't really get down, but he has all he's kinda like I call him Yoda. He's like you don't really know what what kind of power he contains, but he's got a lot of knowledge and um, Right, it's gonna be a little controversial. Three reasons why dubstep is not a dance movement. Uh, <laughs> oh man, you guys are gonna make me look like a <laughs> on this one. I'll go, uh, my number one reason, popping. My number two reason, popping. My number three reason, popping. All right, here's why I say that. Pretty much everything that, you know, everything that's incorporated in dubstep dance, at least from what I understand, from what nonstop, what I've seen him doing and other people who are calling them dubsteppers, it's nothing I haven't seen before. It's popping, they're using elements of popping. And sorry, Pop and Pete, if you're out there, you're seeing this, I understand popping is just flexing, tensing and releasing your muscles on the beat. But I'm looking at it as more of like a general umbrella term. Like if you're waving, if you're gliding, if you're tutting, if you're doing robotic movements, if you're doing isolations, to the beat of the music. To me, that's popping. Those are elements that have already been there. And to me, it's kind of like turfing and flexing and stuff like that. But the only difference is those dance styles have brought a little bit of something extra to the game. Yes, they're using pop, like popping elements. And I'm still, I still think that for the most part, they're poppers, same with jukers. But my problem with people continuing to come up with new like names and new terminologies for what the dance already is, I feel like it's kind of fragmenting a style that's already so separate and people want a piece the pie and it's all about ego and everything. I just want to see unity. I want to see everybody come together and be like, these are all similar styles that we're doing. Let's all come together and move forward and grow this dance. It's such a tiny dance. Why are we trying to like separate it and everybody's trying to get a piece of the pie where it's such like a small thing already, you know? Reach. Two. <laughs> Alright, two. Two of your favorite places you have performed. Uh, this one's an easy one. My first one, number one, is TED Talks. Just being invited to perform at TED Talks in the first place, you know, like 
the minds that have stepped foot on that stage and the information that they've shared and the performers that they've invited to perform there, like it literally choked me up when I found out that we were gonna perform at TED Talks. Like, I don't know, I was with John, I was with Chu at Cheesecake Factory and I don't know like if he had just gotten that email but he's like reading me the email and it's like 12 paragraphs from the creator of TED as to why not just like, hey, you guys are awesome, like we want to see you. No, he like broke it down as to why he thought it would be an honor for them to have us there. So that was like insane for me. And the whole front row was like in tears when we performed, you know, it was like a really like visceral, life-changing moment for me pretty much. Number two, that would be performing at the Oscars, the Academy Awards. 2010 Oscars, just the fact that like I'm, I'm there at the Oscars and I'm like, Dude, I'm a robot. Like, I'm popping. Yeah. Like, I'm this underground street dancer. Like, dude, I'm a robot. Like, and thinking about all the people who judged and questioned my path to that point, you know, and not like I told you so, but just feeling somewhat, somewhat justified in the choices that I made. You know, the fact that I just followed my passion and did what I want to do. It was a little bit of I felt vindicated in what I was doing, you know. And I'm like looking out and like, Freeman and. Uh, just all these like amazing performers that have entertained me for all these years and I'm up there like doing the robot and entertaining them. So yeah, that's my number two. <laughs> Last one, one reason why people are so obsessed with robots. I'm obsessed with robots. I don't know if, if everybody is. I think it's a little bit of like a, like a kind of like a God complex. Like I think that we want to play God and we want to create something in our own image. And this idea that we can create life like just out of nothing and create something that's self-aware and self-sufficient. I think it's a little bit of like a power trip, but then I think it's also feel that maybe we think by creating life, it will teach us more about ourselves and our own life and like how we came to be. And it's, it's almost like playing God will help us find God somehow. I don't see, I don't know fully how to articulate that, but in my mind, it's, there's something spiritual about it. I'm Mad Chad and I survived five. Four, three, two, one. Where did I?